Hello, I'm Wink Martindale. Long before Boss Radio in LA, there was Color Radio, KFWB. In the early 60s, I was the morning man at KFWB, and one November morning in 1961, I played a record by a new group from Hawthorne, California. The record was called Surfin', and of course the group was, who else, the Beach Boys. That morning when I played that record, I had no way of knowing that Surfin' would mark the beginning of one of the most storied successes in pop music history. A story that is still being told to this day, big time. I got to know the Beach Boys personally at the very beginning, and I'm proud to say I've been a friend and a fan ever since. To this day, when you go to one of their sold-out concerts, chances are you'll recognize my voice introducing the Beach Boys on stage, much like I did on KFWB so many November mornings ago. Today, I am delighted to host this exclusive chat with lead singer, songwriter, and founding member of the Beach Boys, my buddy Mike Love. Mike, welcome back. Good to see you. It's great to, to, to be here with you, it's Wink. It's good to be anywhere, isn't it's it? It's good to be anywhere, <laughs> but especially with Wink Martindale. Well, thank that's, you. That's a real plus. You're here to connect with your fans by answering their questions today. Right. And if I may, I'll begin with a couple of questions of my own. Do you mind? Okay. All right. Any particular reason you're doing this, what we're doing today, right now? As you know as well as anybody and better than a lot of people, the new technology affords you different ways to connect with your fans these days, all kinds of different ways, but yeah. this is just one of them and it gives us a chance to really connect and respond to questions that, uh, you know, maybe are a sampling of the millions of questions people might have. There's so, not time to do that in concert when you're on stage. That's true. Anybody this, have a question? <laughs> <laughs> this is a different format right. and it's because of technology. It, and, and so it's kind of cool. We, what does your fan base mean to you? Well, I mean, it means a lifetime of, of fun, 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 good vibrations, all kinds of experiences that we never would have had were it not for the fact that we got you know, very fortunate to be played uh, on the radio and you know the first song we ever recorded uh, surfing became a minor hit and surfing safari a bigger hit and then surfing usa a bigger hit than that and it's never stopped i know it's 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 remarkable so th there's there's no way you can calculate the meaning yeah. of of, of of what our career has meant to us as individuals. When you're up there on stage, you and the Beach Boys, and you look out in the audience, who do you see? What kind of demographic? You old people, young people, mixture of the two, what? It kind of depends on where you are, but we often see entire families turn out. The grandparents, the parents, the young adults, children. Uh, the other night in San Diego, we had a 90-year-old woman on stage, wow. as well as a nine-year-old little girl, all decked out in Beach Boys paraphernalia. So you can't get much wider demographic than, than that. Uh, the, the Beach Boys are fortunate to, that our music appeals to successive generations. Absolutely. Yeah. Mike, take us back, if you will, to November 1961. You and your cousin, Brian Wilson, co-wrote Surfing, which you right. referred to. Did you write the words or music, or did both of you get together and contribute a little bit to both? In our collaboration, um, when I, when Brian and I would, would go to the piano. I, I primarily did the words, uh -huh. but I would come up with hooks, too. And because of the extreme influence of doo-wop on, on the Beach Boys, we loved doo-wop, all the different harmonies and great songs and stuff. I came up with the bomp, bomp, dip, da dip, da dip. But I wrote all the words, and Brian did the harmonies as he is is, uh, you know, incredibly gifted and able to do. You didn't take lessons from Neil Sedaka on that bump, 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 boop, bump, bump, because he used to do that too on all of his well, records. Uh, well, he wasn't the only one. <laughs> and, uh, we, we were influenced by all the great, great music of the day. And, and uh, you know, but so, so it, surfing was really primitive, but it had some uniqueness to it, the and vocals, the subject matter about yeah. surfing, something unique to Southern yeah. California. Is it possible after all these years to remember your feeling, if you can remember the first time you heard surfing on the radio? The thing is, there was a radio station, not color radio, but another station who had a, 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 a thing where they'd play four different songs, and the one that got the most requests would be the song of the week, the next week, yeah. and they play it every every couple hours. We had such an extended family. My mom was one of uh, eight children and we had so many cousins and friends and family members and, and 
that, that we easily won the contest of the most call-ins. And so surfing became that, that uh, record of the week. And, uh, but it was so exciting to hear your first song on the radio. There's, it's, it's inexplicable, inexplicable practically. Yeah. Uh, how exciting it was it was so you know just like a bunch of kids with christmas presents and it was to hear it on the radio was just phenomenal it's like a dream come true it was it... mike from the many interesting questions that beach boy fans submitted for this fan forum today i've compiled what i feel are 20 of the most representative questions so let's start at the beginning shall we let's do it okay endless summer has this question how did you decide at the very beginning, who would play what instrument? Well, Carl Wilson, um, Brian Dennis and Carl Wilson, the Wilson brothers, my first cousins. Carl Wilson was the one who had really uh, learned a lot of guitar. He played with our, his neighbor friend David Marks uh, before David joined our group. But Brian would always be at the piano figuring out chords and arrangements for freshmen, whatever it may be. Um, so he learned the stand-up bass. He picked up the bass right away. Dennis picked up the drumsticks and became the drummer. Alan Jardine, on, who recorded Surfing with us, he, he was, he, by virtue of his um, being a big um, fan of the Kingston Trio, he played rhythm guitar. Yeah. And so we, I played a little saxophone during those days, and, but my main instrument has always been the, the microphone. Right. <laughs> and you do a good job with that well, microphone, you know. too. I've seen you work many times. <laughs> Mike, this comes from Kevin Abbey. At what point, at what point did you guys really get the idea that you were onto something big and that your music was getting bigger than you ever thought possible? The thing that occurs to me when you asked me that question was the time we were at a ballroom at Lake Minnetonka outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the, the place was sold out and kids were breaking the windows to get in. And when we, we did four sets that night, and after our second set, we went outside and looked down the roadway, and there were still lines of, a line of cars, so you could see the headlights all the way down the road. There wow. seemed like there's no end to it. So, and, I, and I was thinking, wow, this is really something. You're coming this, to see us? Yeah, that it was like, the thought literally came, this must have been like it was when Elvis started out. Yeah. You know, it's just that, that incredible popularity and that was all due to the radio and the and the airplay we got with in that particular instance surf and safari so that was the moment you really knew you were onto something i had to be it felt like such a phenomenon you know and it, obviously who could foretell how long we would would be in the business and stuff but uh, that was the moment that i recall it sticks out in my mind when it when it really look like something remarkable was happening. Let me ask you this. Uh, in, in interviewing Elvis Presley once, I said, uh, did you ever get the idea that this was going to go on forever? He said, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I'm afraid I'm going to wake up and this will all be over. <laughs> did you ever have that kind of a feeling? Mm, you know, I never doubted. I just did the best I could on stage and in the studio. I, I think you just have to... And let the rest take care of itself. Exactly. It's kind of like you have to live life. A lot of people have been nervous on stage. I was nervous the first time we went on stage in a Long Beach Memorial Auditorium for a Richie Valens Memorial Dance and Show, December 31st, 1961. I was so nervous, I said, well, I am the one that's suffering here. Forget it. I'm just going to go out and do as well as I can, and that's just going to have to be good enough. And I think that's how I approach the, the concerts. I yeah. do as well as I can. You never get nervous now, do you? I, I very seldom get nervous. Mike, this year is the 50th anniversary of California Girls. That was the first time I believe that Bruce Johnston sang on a Beach Boys studio recording, right? That's right. So here's a question from Beach Boys fan forever. Where did you and Brian come up with the idea for a song, California Girls? First of all, Brian Wilson had the idea for California Girls. He had the title, but he had no words. So while he was finishing up with the, with the uh, musicians in the studio, doing a phenomenal track. I was out in the, the hallway writing out on a legal, <laughs> yellow legal line paper that, well, East Coast girls are hip. I really dig the styles they wear. I tried to encapsulate all the great areas of the United States and then around the world and uh, extol the virtues of, of the, uh, all, all the girls from everywhere. And, and you know, 
it wasn't exclusively about California girls. It was about all the girls around the world. But I figure it this way. California is a microcosm of the United States, which is a microcosm of the world. And all the girls in California are literally from all over the place. So we just try to be inclusive. And, and we were a bunch of young guys who'd seen, had some travel, been to Germany, been to England, been to Australia. And, you know, we, uh, when you're out there uh, with the crowds of people and half of them are girls, you're going to notice. Aside it's, from the fact <laughs> that California girls is still one of your all-time biggest sellers, and aside from the fact that you live in California, you are a California boy, are California girls really all that special? Do you think so? I think, uh, I think it's quite possible <laughs> that they are, you know. Okay. But not to be excluding the others. All right. From Vicki Halbison. Uh, there was a lot of fun evident in Barbara Ann from the Party album. Mm -hmm. Is that the way the band wanted it recorded, or was it more spontaneous? Well, um, it literally was a party. We were getting a lot of pressure from Capitol Records to come up with another album. And Brian was in the midst of uh, working on the arrangements and the recording of the tracks for the Pet Sounds album. Mm -hmm. So in order to satisfy Capitol Records, we say, what can we do? We literally set up in the studio uh, and had a, literally a party and everybody uh, would recommend a song that we ought to do. Some of them were like Barbara Ann, for instance, comes to mind. That was the most notable and most popular one from, that, from that, uh, those sessions. But it literally was a party. And so when you have the, 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 the funny bits about it and just loose, you know, people talking and singing along and Dean Torrance actually came and sang with us, although he wasn't supposed to, he did. <laughs> I'm glad he did, we're still friends. And, uh, but no, it was literally a party. That's why you get the feeling you get when you listen to that song. Yeah, it is a fun record, yeah. just fun. Mike, this is from Rebez. The warmth of the sun is such a hauntingly beautiful recording. Did you write the song before or after hearing of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy? How did the news affect the song's lyric? It was, the, it was November 1963, and I went over to Brian's house that he'd just rented in Hawthorne, not too far away from the home residence, but he'd moved out of the home. Mm -hmm. And he was at the keyboard playing the most haunting melody and, and beautiful harmonies. And the, the feeling was so melancholy that the only thing I could think of to relate to musically or lyrically was the, you were in love with somebody and the, the feeling of loss because they didn't feel the same way anymore. That, so that's the inspiration um, or the thought behind the lyrics. But we awakened in the morning to the news that President Kennedy had been taken to Parkland Memorial Hospital mm -hmm. in Dallas. So we all know what happened there. And when we did record the song a couple of weeks after we recorded it, it was charged with that extra emotion that that event, um, you know, embodied in us but we didn't change the lyrics to conform to that horrible event but definitely the emotion of that time and that incident were with us when we recorded that a good answer for rebez's question this is from ryan mm -hmm. what do you think of dennis wilson's pacific ocean blue you know dennis was a sailor he lived on a boat at times during his life he loved the sea and he loved and we all love the environment um, uh, since the earliest times of our, our, our career. Mm -hmm. So he, Dennis asked me to write words for, for the, the song on the album, and we collaborated on that because we both had a, a, a fondness of the ocean and the environment. And so I was honored to be asked to do that. And, and it's, it's the kind of thing that we all came together on. Um, in fact, but it wasn't the first time we dealt with something environmental. Uh, I would say the first time was, a, uh, earlier time was a song called Don't Go Near the Water, which was, we actually did the video on the beach at Brighton in England. So, yeah, there's been a long history of the Beach Boys and appreciation of the environment, whether it's the, the beach or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Jumping ahead a few years to the seminal album Pet Sounds, from Justin, Pet Sounds is one of my favorite albums, and every time I put it on and hear the opening to Wouldn't It Be Nice, I get so excited, it feels like I'm listening to it for the first time all over again. What are some of your fondest memories while recording this phenomenal album, and how difficult was it to undergo such a drastic change in style, 
And did you ever have doubts on whether or not this was the direction you wanted the Beach Boys to go? Long question, you can give me a short or a long answer. The fact is we worked very hard on that album, Pet Sounds album, and, and uh, one of the things, we were doing like 20 different takes on a section of Wouldn't It Be Nice, the mm -hmm. song he's referring to. Yeah. And uh, I actually started calling Brian dog ears because he would hear things <laughs> that humans couldn't. And, uh, but there was never any a doubt as to the experimental or departure from the, the format that we, we had done prior to that. Uh, but there were doubts in the mind of Capitol Records. They did, couldn't quite handle it, didn't know quite how to market that. Really? Yeah, it was, Carl Ingeman was the, uh, the uh, A&R guy for the, in charge of the Beach Boys at that time. Was and there a, a thought maybe at Capitol of holding it back and not putting I, it out? I'm, I don't think they held it back and, and didn't want to put it out, but they did, Carl did say, can't you do something more like California Girls or I Get Around or Surfing USA? Because that was what they were so successful with Correct. us for. It took many years for that, uh, for the Pet Sounds album to, uh, um, to go platinum, yeah. which it eventually did. But, but it was a big, huge influence on a lot of people in the uh, musical industry. And I agree with uh, the fellow who it says the opening strains of "Wouldn't It Be Nice." It, uh, we we have that same feeling on stage when we when we do that song or the song "God Only Knows." We actually have Carl Wilson on on video with us, and we back him up. That's a terrific part of the yeah. concert. It's an emotional part, yeah. and it gives um, you know it gives a accolades to to the, nobody did that song better than Carl Wilson. So right. why even try? I mean, you can do it as a tribute, but it's really nice having Carl with us from the Pet Sounds album, God Only Knows. But I, I agree with that person. When you hear some of these songs, that, those aren't the only ones, but you hear those opening strains of a song and it takes you back to a certain time or elevates your mood. Isn't it true that all of your music, the Beach Boys music, takes us all back to a certain time? Music has a way of doing that. It, yeah. it, the soundtracks of our lives, as Dick Clark says. Yes. It, and we grow up with this and we, it just make, it's feel good music. It is, but the neat thing about it is it is not only feel good music for those of us who uh, started with the Beach Boys in the 60s, but it's still feel good music even for younger people who hear it for the first time. And yeah, that's why your audience keeps growing constantly. It does, it does. A question from Holland, this is from Bill Goodman. Uh, this happens to be about your Holland album. What is your most distinguished memory of living in the Netherlands? Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I had an apartment, well it was a townhouse kind of thing, in a place called Bloemendal, which is a, it's not even in Amsterdam, it's, yeah. it's in a different town. But it was fantastic because you'd step out the door, go to the, 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 uh, the uh, grocery store down, and, and there's unbelievable fruit from North Africa and all over the place and go back home and have some, you know, orange juice and some muesli with some fresh fruit on it. So I remember that. That sticks out in my mind. And, and the fact that we were in a different country uh, to record and experience living in a different place other than we're, what we were so used to. But it's, it's ironic that even though we were in Holland, we did songs about California. Yeah. So I think we were probably homesick. Have you ever returned to do another concert there? Oh yes, we've done concerts in Holland. We, we did one in a place called the Concert Gebouw, which they had literally have Chopin and Handel and Mozart, all these iconic names in music all around and it's a wooden structure. And we've we had a couple of concerts there and it's, it's quite and you'll never forget that. It was such a beautiful venue. And I assume that when you're in the Netherlands, you still enjoy your breakfast. Ah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah. Sean P. 730 says, how does the great album Summer in Paradise rank in ratings to you as far as the albums, all the albums you guys have done? I think every album has its own personality and own mix of records, and a mix of authors of, of the songs and, and different sounds, but Summer in Paradise, the thing that, the song Summer in Paradise to me is the Beach Boys anthem about the environment. I mean, the, the, the fact is that uh, there's a line in the song that goes, uh, we're all under attack. 
meaning the environment becomes so polluted at some point that it barely sustains life. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are, you know, there's articles about fish being no good to eat because of mercury or whatever yeah. kind of thing. So being sensitive to the environment, a lifelong sensitivity to the environment. I used to chase butterflies with a friend of mine, Dr. Thomas Emmel, who has a couple of PhDs and, and he's a lepidopterist, means he's studied butterflies and moths yeah. his whole yeah. life. I used to chase butterflies with this guy. So I've been a lifelong, you know, I've had a lifelong sensitivity to the needs of the environment and, and not only humanity, but other forms of life. So I think Summer in Paradise encapsulates those feelings in the song. Okay. Moving on to some questions about transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. Mike, let's talk about something that's I know near and dear to your heart. I know you're deeply into TM. What year did you start meditating? Uh, I went to a lecture in, in, in uh, I think it was early December or late November of 67. But then we were invited to go to, to Paris to do a UNICEF show at, at this uh, beautiful theater in Paris with an orchestra behind us. Mm -hmm. And when the curtain opens, there was Maharishi and, and, and one side was um, George Harrison, another side John Lennon. And we were, we had met Maharishi in the rehearsals and my cousin Dennis, we'd, we left um, to go back to London and, and no sooner we got to London, my cousin Dennis, who had stayed in Paris said, you, you gotta come back to Paris. I said, well, why is that? I like England. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he says, because Maharishi is gonna teach us to meditate. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I said, well, we're not gonna come back to Paris unless you're sure. So he called me back about an hour later, said, yeah, it's on. And so we flew back the next morning after being in England for a few hours and um, met with Maharishi, he gave us an introductory lecture and then came, brought us into the room and, and taught us the TM technique, which was the simplest thing to learn and yet very, very profoundly relaxing. And I thought, gosh, if, if, if everybody could learn this, it'd be an entirely different world. And so, I was fortunate enough to be uh, asked uh, by Maharishi to, to invited to go to a, a teacher training course, which I didn't even know what it, that it was a teacher training course, in uh, the spring of 1968, just a couple months later. And that was a real, real profound experience for me. And there was a time that you ended up in India with the Beatles. That's the one. Just, that was in it. fact, George Harrison had his birthday on February 25th, and I had my birthday on March 15th in India at Maharishi's place in 1968. By the way, may I say happy birthday to you oh, in advance? Thank you. Because the 15th is your birthday. It is, uh, March 15th. You'll be 21 again, 22? Close. Yeah. <laughs> Who's counting numbers? Yes, it's, it'll be like the fiftieth anniversary of my twenty-first birthday, something like that. <laughs> anyway, happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mike. And I'm sure I speak for all your fans too. From Nick Patrillo, I wanted to know if you wrote any songs when you were in India in 1968, aside from helping Paul McCartney with "Back in the USSR." Yes. I did, as a matter of fact. There was a song on, on a Beach Boy album called Annalee the Healer. There was another one called Everyone's in Love with You. And Everyone's in Love with You, you was a little different because everybody's used to romance and, and, and chemistry, boy-girl chemistry and all that. But Everyone's in Love with You is about witnessing the type of devotion or love that people had for Maharishi and vice versa around Maharishi. It's a, di a love of a different kind. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, a love that Mother Teresa would have for the, out of her de uh, devotion to God, Got it. To, to, that she displayed in her lifetime. Yeah. So everyone's in love with you, different. That was inspired by that time in India. And Maharishi spoke from this body of knowledge called the Vedas. Vedas are very, very ancient scriptures. And one of the things from those scriptures is this, that we did a song about. I worked with Alan Jardine on it. It's called, All This Is That. I am that, thou art that, all this is that. Meaning we're all coming from the same source. Mm -hmm. and we don't always act like it, <laughs> but, but uh, in truth, we're all coming from that same inexhaustible reservoir of creativity and intelligence that underlies everything. And so that, that's from the Vedas. And whenever we do that in concert, it's kind of a deeper cut, but I, I love doing it. It has a mystical effect. From 
MIU fan, can you provide any tips to someone interested in learning TM? You should look up Transcendental Meditation Program and they can refer you to a qualified instructor who has learned by going to these te teacher training courses, yeah. learn the technique and, and is, is um, you know, is capable of teaching it in the way it's meant to be taught, which is you have an introductory lecture, a preparatory talk, and four days of instruction and a follow-up thing about a week later. So it's basically a seven-step yeah. kind of situation. This is from Butler B. Do you think that without the transcendental meditation you learn from the Maharishi, you might have slipped down the path of uh, alcohol or drugs? I used to drink hard alcohol and wasn't shy about it either. And in the early, well, in the mid-60s, I was known to smoke some weed with, uh, with some of the other fellows. Mm -hmm. But when I learned TM, I said, well, there are negative aspects that every family's been impacted by with alcohol, similarly with drugs. Um, so I understand completely want people wanting to relax or, or get away from problems and worries and stuff. For whether reality, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, whether it's temporary or for just a little, little relief. I totally understand it. Life can be tough. But I found that meditation gives you that deep relaxation that allows you to cope with the stresses of life mm -hmm. without the negative side effects of some of these other things. So I just made a conscious decision. I said, this is what I'm going to do uh, because I'm an extremist in some ways, and if I got extremely into alcohol, I would have gone that way. Yeah. Or if I would extremely into drugs, a person can go that way. I just made a decision that this is a much better thing for yourself and your family to 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 uh, to gain the the results of medi of a relaxation, mm -hmm. and and they say it expands your awareness. They say your IQ actually grows. Uh, when even if you're 80 years old and you learned TM, your IQ is grows, and that's unheard of. But the research shows that. So it's so good on so many levels, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that uh, it's been a big, huge benefit to me, and I'm really grateful to Maharishi for for teaching it. And it's so sad that so many people in your business, my business, mm -hmm. have been taken from us far too soon because oh, yeah. of alcohol and or drugs. Absolutely. Really sad. Absolutely. Mike, let's talk about your solo work. Mm -hmm. Going through the questions, there are a lot of fans of your solo work. For example, from Dutchie. Hi, Mike. Any chance of releasing officially all your solo songs? We are in the midst of figuring out how to do that. See, with the changes of the, of the record industry in the last, you know, 20 years or so, it's pretty dramatic. And so, uh, it's kind of like if you have a bunch of children, you don't want to let those children go out and play on the freeway. Right. You'd like to make sure that they're safe and that they're accepted wherever they, they go. And that's how it is with, with the songs that you care about. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you want to make sure that they have the right outlet, the right chance to survive and thrive. And so we are in the midst of doing that. Let's say if I wrote a song 30 years ago, but I never put it out. Well, it might be dated. So maybe you need a different guitar sound. Maybe my voice was buried with too many backgrounds. There are all these decisions and we're reviewing a lot of my songs that I've, I've been cataloging over the years with the idea of preparing them so that they might fit in a movie soundtrack. Maybe we will do a, a, an LP. Uh, you know, th so th these are all kind of things that we're currently working on. And in this very studio, working with a terrific uh, A&R man, Michael right. Lloyd, you're That's right. doing that right now. We are. Uh, from Doug, what are some deep cuts that you secretly wish more people knew about? I mentioned a couple of them in the context of meditation because yes. all this is that comes from the Vedas and it's, it's got that mystical uh, value to it. And so that's one that we often do some of the deeper cuts at our VIP sound checks that we don't do in the concerts because maybe they're a bit esoteric and we have a lot of, fortunately, we have a lot of hits to play and we want to, don't want to dis disappoint anybody. Yeah. So, um, but we will do these, these deeper cuts from time to time in, in our VIP sound checks. Any of those that come to your mind, you might think a specific artist today would do a good job on? 
I think there are a lot of them. I mean, I we do wild honey once in a while. Uh, um, uh, John Cowshill, our, our drummer, mm -hmm. sings it. Carl Wilson did it on on the um, on the Wild Honey album. But there's a song called Darling, a song called Wild Honey. There's a few other songs on there that, but you know, Wild Honey could be done by I I I thought it would be great if Bruno Mars would do it. I would love to hear that. I the can even hear Bruce Springsteen doing it. Yes, he could. Be pretty Absolutely. Wild. Yeah, and then then Darlin could be done on, by any number of yeah. people. Would you ever release Looking Back with Love remastered for iTunes or another downloadable format? We're not against it. It's just that we have a, a probably 60 or 70 songs we're going through right now. So we'll, 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 that'll be one of our considerations. Fantastic piece of work. From Doug Burrell, it was such a treat being able to listen to Pisces Brother on SoundCloud. Would you consider releasing more of your solo work online for your fans to hear? We released Pisces Brother, by the way, um, on George Harrison's birthday a year or so ago. And so, <clears throat> yes, we would. I think it's a great way to introduce music um, that you've recorded and you feel good about and that you would like other people to hear mm -hmm. without being... Um, concerned with the commercial aspects of it, meaning sales. Right. I think it's a wonderful way with the cloud in which to introduce your music. Judging by the fact there are so many questions regarding your solo work that we've been talking about, there really seems to be a demand for it. I believe it would be well received, and I mean that in all sincerity. Let's talk about your current tour schedule. Okay. You love to work, by the way. You love to sing, and you love to entertain your fans. Idle hands. <laughs> Idle hands are a devil's workshop, you know that. So <laughs> to no, me, it yeah. seems you're always on the road. How many shows did you do last year, and how does the calendar for 2015 look? We did 142 performances last year in 135 locations, meaning in wow. some of them there are two shows a day, an afternoon and an evening. So yeah, we like to work. The musicians love it. We like what we do. It's a blessing to be able to do music especially your own music, and have people appreciate it 50 years after you started. So it's not like somebody's forcing us to do this stuff. And, and it's wonderful that we get, we get it's wonderful that we get um, in, invitations to go all over the world and do our, do our thing. And there are sometimes, I know, when you finish a show in this city and you have to rush to the airport, get on a plane, because mm -hmm. you're doing uh, another show the very next night, mm -hmm. doesn't that get a little hectic sometimes? It can be a little hectic, but um, yeah, so it's called one-nighters, and that's the way it is. <laughs> that's you know? the way it works. It, it's better these days than when we were in a, a station wagon with a with a U-Haul trailer with our equipment in it. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot better these days, believe me. This is from Patricia Forelli. Mm. How do you go about making a set list? And I've often one, wondered about this myself. I've noticed the songs change from show to show during the course of a tour. What goes into creating the song selection for any given set list? That's a good question. Thanks for sending it in, Patricia. I personally like to start kind of retro and get because the energy of the first songs, the surfing songs, and the car songs is, is pretty it upbeat. It sets the mood for the it, whole evening. It sure does. And, and so I like personally like the energy involved in getting up tempo songs to begin with. Then we'll drop it down to a, a surfer girl or a don't worry baby, something a little more mellow, and I I, I like that. And but then from there it's a, it's about where you are. If you're in a performing arts center or a theater, you can do some of the more subtle songs. If you're in a um, at a casino, or if you're in a, a fairgrounds. Maybe the subtlety is going to be lost, mm -hmm. so we keep it more up tempo and so on. So there's more rock and roll involved yeah. in a situation uh, like in a, a fairgrounds or something like that, or a stadium. So, so there it has to do with the 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 place in which you find yourself, and the acoustics and all that. So, but but it's trial and error. We will do a song and it won't go over. Uh, we've done that in the past, and so guess what? That song doesn't get played a whole lot unless it's a special <laughs> occasion that somebody 
early requests. I used to wonder, how do you know what song comes next? And I didn't know until one night I was watching you guys mm -hmm. on I was up on stage, mm -hmm. and I looked, and there's a little cue sheet down there on the stage. Yes, that's true. <laughs> we do have a cheat sheet. Yeah, but but we, we've found that one song will support the next one, yeah. whether it be the tempo or the lead singer or, or the arrangement or the subject matter. Like, I wouldn't do 409 into God Only Knows into Shutdown, yeah. you know, but I might do God Only Knows into Sloop John B and Wouldn't It Be Nice. Do you make the decision about the lineup of songs or do you do it as a group? I'm very much involved with that and always have been, yeah. yeah. This is from Nick. Okay. With your busy touring schedule, how do you find to meditate? How do you find time to meditate while being on the road? I have meditated in trains, planes, cars, buses, dressing rooms, and stuff. But when we do our concert in the afternoon, I mean, when we do our sound check in the afternoon, early evening, um, we'll break for dinner, and I'll go and break, and I'll meditate. And I've found that if I meditate prior to the show. My performance is better. Uh, I think the audience response is, is, is even better because I have more energy and clarity to bring to the event. And you feel more relaxed? Exactly. And do you plan to include later 60s and 70s Beach Boy material into your set list in the near future? Again, this from Nick. You know, we did a, a, um, a Made in California box set, and in the doing of it, we came across some songs that we, we had recorded but never came out on, on, on record. Yeah. One of them, which we do now in our opening sequence, called Going to the Beach. So yes, we, we're, we're open to, and, and when, when something is brought to our attention that is a cool song that goes in our set list, we, we do like to vary. We like to freshen up for ourselves as well as the fans. Little P.S. from Nick, it was great hearing Wild Honey last summer. John, John Castle. Big, it? Yes, John Castle does an amazing job on that. This is from Claire D77. asks How much are you enjoying the meet and greet, answering questions in a group compared to in the past talking to people who were backstage to meet you? Is it a better atmosphere doing it this way? It's a remarkable ac atmosphere. It sounds like, you know, uh, I don't know if it's, if I can convey it properly, but we did a meet and greet one time with a, a 10 year old girl who had some health issues. And I asked her, what is your favorite Beach Boy song? And this girl's 10 years old. She said, 409. 409 came out 40 years before she was born. <laughs> <laughs> so that blew my mind. And, and, and I actually got her out to come out on stage and she sang 409 along with me when we did wow. that during our car, car songs. That's great. It was beautiful. And then there are other people who tell us stories about, you know, somebody passed away and they want a Beach Boy music played at their, their wake or their funeral, whatever, and, and or the Vietnam veterans of, I mean, they gave me a bangle. One guy gave me a bangle that I wear that he got in Vietnam somewhere, if I can dig it out. Here we go. And I happened to wear it. It, it reminds me of the impact that our music had on the servicemen at that time during the 60s. We're having a ball singing Surfing USA and having fun, 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 and these guys are getting shot at or shooting at yeah. people. So, their their emotions and influences that our music has had on people that are virtually incalculable. But it makes you feel like what you've done was not only popular for its time, but is still worthwhile to so many millions of people. I can only imagine what a warm feeling all you guys get by performing oh, yeah. to young and old alike exactly. and seeing how happy your music makes them. Exactly. Just terrific. It's phenomenal. And people ask us, well, why do you can still continue to tour? Uh, because it's a blessing, actually. And we're doing what we started out doing as a family hobby, became a profession and, yeah. and, and a long-lasting one at that. This is from Gail Tracy Owen. Mm -hmm. With the demands from the road, business and family, how do you keep balance in your life? Well, the thing there is, if we're going to uh, various parts of the world and we know we're going to be somewhere for a couple of, more than a couple of days, family will be invited. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, you know, we've had our children come out and, and, and you know, one, uh, I remember going to Bali for Christmas one time and uh, Mexico a couple of different times. We will travel as a family, uh, not just with the Beach Boys, but other times of, 
of year for special occasions, uh, we'll, we'll get together. So it is a sacrifice though, I will say. A traveling musician spends a lot of time away from home. Yeah. So there's the positive part of doing, your, doing things uh, and making a lot of people happy, but there are sacrifices that you make in terms of personal time with your family and kids and stuff. It's fun to do what you do, yes. but in order to do what you do to the millions of fans around the world, yeah. you've got to go to them. They can't right. come to you always. That's right. Yeah. So there is a sacrifice to be made there, yeah. but, but I think ultimately it's, it's, you know, I'm not complaining because there are many people that go to work however many hours a day. My dad and my grandfather, they worked so hard doing sheet metal work so what I do is not hard by, by any stretch of the imagination, like their life was. And many lives, many people, they, they spend their time at work and they come home. Um, ours is just a little, it's a different situation. But, I've, I've often said, you know, from the time I was seven or eight years old, I knew what I wanted to do with my mm. life. I wanted to be in radio and then, well, of course, really television. Great. There's so many people who get up and go to work 40, 50 years old and they hate what they're doing. Yeah. It's sad. Yeah, it is sad and we're, we're fortunate to, yes. to love what we're doing. Let's talk about legacy. Okay. From Ronan, I'm 17, I live in Ireland and I've been in love with your stuff since I first heard Good Vibrations. Here are my questions. He's got a list of questions here now. We'll take them one by one. Okay. The Beach Boys have left an unbelievable and profound impression on the music industry. Along with bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, you guys are never going to be forgotten. What do you think the legacy will be for artists of today? Of today? I think it always gets back to the song. Like you mentioned Good Vibrations. Well, they're, they're great songs by many great artists. A good song with a great performance, that is going to enter to the legacy of anybody. Mm -hmm. And there are people today, there is a type of music today that is very popular with people that might be electronic and stuff. To me, I don't think that that's going to be as lasting as, as maybe uh, a really good performance by a really great artist. You know, Amy Winehouse is a great singer. Adele's a great singer. Uh, Katy Perry is incredibly creative and, and another great singer. And uh, there's so many that when, when you pair the song with, with the artist uh, done, done the right way, it's going to, you know, it's going to be, a, the, that's the legacy kind of thing there. Looking at the groups of the day, do you think in 50 years any of them will have a prominent and lasting influence like the Beach Boys? I don't know, but I think it's quite possible that, that somebody that, that has a really strong following and does really great work and has great songs, there's every possibility that they will be known many years from but now. But you might be able to count them on one hand. <laughs> yeah, that, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. And what was it about the 60s that brought such phenomenally talented artists? And why don't we have lasting quality in music anymore? It seems like, you know, we used to have number one songs stay on uh, top of the charts, cash box, billboard for weeks at a time. Now mm, it's true. they're lucky if they stay two weeks. Mm. Well, you know, it's definitely in a changing environment in, in music as well as radio. Uh, and so uh, I'm not an expert at that, but I always get back to the song and the performance of it. And I think that that's the only way that people are going to uh, have a lasting Im impression on, on, on the world of music. Yeah. This is from Suwu. If you could go back in time and relive one of your concerts, mm. which one would it be and why? Does well, one stand out? No, a couple stand out, <laughs> but one of them was Czechoslovakia in 1969. It was a few months after the Russians in, had invaded Czechoslovakia, and we were welcomed there like, you know, heroes. First of all, we were from America, and it was during the time of the Cold War. Second of all, we played rock and roll, you know, and w uh, we were extremely well received. It was, it was pandemonium. They whistled and stomped at the same time uh, and it, that was one that I really remember because when we landed in Czechoslovakia on one side of the, uh, the runway at the airport were the Russian tanks, the other side the Russian uh, fighter jets. So it was very intimidating but they, I think we were welcome because we, we 
represented America and the antithesis of what they had been subjected mm -hmm. to by the, the Russians. So that's one. But the other thing is stepping out on stage on July 4th in Washington, D.C. and getting a standing ovation before we did anything. I saw that. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's amazing when over a half a million people give you a standing ovation. You, you know, it's, it's just a phenomenal it feeling. It is something to look out at that size crowd. Oh, it's unbelievable. And know that they're waiting for you to perform. It, it, was, yeah. it, it, was, a, it was an experience of a lifetime. Yeah. From Heather Tessie, one... What is one of your proudest moments as a beach boy? One of your proudest moments as a beach boy. I think when we were voted the number one group in Great Britain, number two being the Beatles, number three being the Stones in 1966 on the basis of good vibrations, um, being number one in, in Great Britain, that was, I was pretty proud of that because there was no one more popular um, than the Beatles at the time, but to, to be that well regarded in Great Britain, to be voted the number one act, and to have a song, the, the song, Good Vibrations, uh, be so impactful. Yeah. I mean, it was to that 17-year-old guy from Ireland. Yeah. Well, um, it, was, it was an amazing uh, thing. I think I had to be proud of the, that fact. Mike, one last question for you today. This is from the Pendletones. Question, how do you want the Beach Boys to be remembered? I think there are all kinds of things that go on within a group, just like any family, where there might be positive things, negative things. But the overwhelming story of the Beach Boys is the positivity and through the harmonies and the music and the, and the melodies and all the arrangements and all the work that we've done, it's provided so much um, solace for some. It's, it's provided so much entertainment for people. It's provided a, like a sonic oasis where people can get away from their problems for, for a little while by either playing a record or playing a song or coming to our, one of our concerts. So I think that's the legacy of the Beach Boys that, that should be remembered is the, the impact the music has had in a very positive way. We didn't deal with a lot of negativity. We always accentuated the positive. That's always been my philosophy. And I think ultimately that's what uh, is memorable and should be remembered about the Beach Boys. No message songs, just fun songs. Well, make I you think feel good. fun songs is a message in itself. Yeah, Accentuating sure. the positive is a message in itself. Mike, I'm sure that this has been most enlightening and interesting to all of your fans. Personally, I got to tell you that I learned a lot today listening to you talk that I wasn't aware of, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed it. And Thank speaking you. for all of your fans out there, and I know that uh, I speak for them in saying many thanks that uh, you've devoted to this time to their questions. Oh, well, thank you, Wink, for, for, for being a part of this. My this pleasure. Is really, it's an honor for me thank you. to have you do this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it again sometime. Let's do it all again. Right. A song of that name. <laughs> <laughs>